Imagine a movie is being made. The movie is about horse racing. The locations are all over the United States. Hollywood Park, Santa Anita, in, on the East Coast, Aqueduct, Belmont, Pimlico in, in Maryland, in Florida, Hialeah, Calder, Gulfstream, and one of the most famous racetracks of all, Churchill Downs, of course, in Lexington, Kentucky. Now this movie lasts 10 years and there's all kinds of characters. You've got on the back side of the racetrack you have grooms and hot walkers and trainers, exercise riders and all the people who work on the back side and then you have the, the owners and the trainers who have money to spend to buy these beautiful horses and then you have all the drama of gambling and racing. Now imagine being dropped in the middle of this and spending 10 years, not so much as an important character, but an observer and to watch all these things happening around you. It was the most exciting 10 years of my life and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So people ask me, how did you get started? Well, I was working for Hughes Aircraft Company part-time as a structural assembler and I was going to school and I was going to become an engineer and one day my co-workers would come back from work and they would go to Hollywood Park and they said David you're small you should become a horse jockey and I thought that was pretty funny because I didn't know anything about racing or I mean I knew what a horse jockey was but that's about all I knew and then about two weeks later I was working up on some scaffolding in a hangar and this man walked in and he walks down the aisle and he grabs his time card and he punches the clock and he was probably about 30 years old, uh, maybe 35, and when you're 19, that seems a little older. And I envisioned myself maybe 15 or 20 years still working in that hangar building helicopters. And I wasn't so excited about that at that moment. And then something really off the cup happened. I was opening the Sunday newspaper in Los Angeles. You have the Times and you have the Parade magazine that always has some picture on the front. And I opened up the Parade magazine and right there on the front page was a picture of horses jumping out of a starting gate. And they were just frozen in that photo. And suddenly the comments of those guys, the picture of the guy working 20 years in the hangar, and the, the image of that scene of horse racing, it's just like, wow, what would it be like to, to be there and do that? And in that moment, I decided I would, wanted to be a horse jockey. So like two days later, I called up Hollywood Racetrack, and the person who answered the phone, I said, how do you become a horse jockey? And there was like silence at the end of the phone. It's like, well, uh, actually, he said, there's this ranch out in Chino, California, called the Ellsworth Ranch. You might go check with them. I think they have some kind of a jockey school. So I found out that the Ellsworth Ranch was a large thoroughbred operation. They had won the Kentucky Derby with swaps in 1956. They had had horses like Candy Spots and Call Ed, and they were serious thoroughbred horse people. I went out there. They had a program where they needed hundreds of horses exercised on a daily basis. They would send horses to all the various racetracks around the country. They had trainers at the various racetracks, and they needed boys to exercise these horses. So they had a program. If you would work for them, commit to work for them for four to five years as an exercise rider, they would start you racing professionally. And they were willing to pay me $50 a week, give me a room in the barn, and four and a half years later, if I stayed with them, I could race professionally. I signed up. It sounded like a good deal. My parents <laughs> were stressed out. I had a scholarship to become an engineer. My sister said, David, that's a gypsy's life. You're going to be traveling around and it's dangerous. But I, I had my heart set on it. So fast forward, I, I bring my suitcases, I arrive at the ranch, and the first time I visited, I didn't notice that there were many boys on crutches with casts on their arms, with braces on their necks, 
and found out that these horses, these yearlings, were wild. I mean, they were thoroughbred yearlings, and they were putting us up on them with no experience and leading us around on a pony, and we had to figure this out. And honestly, if I hadn't burned so many bridges, told so many people that I was going to become rich and famous racing horses, that first week I might have just chucked it and gone back home. But after a while, I got used to it. And about eight months later, they sent me to the racetrack. The first racetrack I went to was Golden Gate Fields in uh, San Mateo, California. And I went to work for a trainer there. Now, your responsibilities at the track as an exercise rider is to ride the horses every morning. You get up at 5 o'clock. The trainer puts up an overnight, which is a list of the horses you are going to ride. There's probably five or six exercise riders, and you have your list of horses you're going to ride. The grooms saddle them up. You go to the track about four f horses at a time, your group of exercise riders, and you might gallop the horse slow, or if it's time to work the horse, you would actually let him run. Now, the tough job was holding the horses slow. I mean, you would jack your irons up, put your feet in front of you and wrap those reins around your hands and pull like this and just pray that this horse doesn't get away from you because they just want to run. And they have outriders on the track that actually are there for your protection and assistance. If your horse would get away from you and literally be running flat out with you unable to keep him slow, then the outrider would come, just like in the movies, he would come uh, like, like they jump on the stage coaches when the horse, when the stage coaches run away, he would come up and grab the horse and pull the horse to a stop while you were still on him to keep you from having him run away. So these are the kinds of things that were happening. Now, the other responsibility of us as exercise boys was in the afternoon to take the horses that we were riding to the racetracks by foot to get them into a stall like they were going to race, but they really weren't going to. This was just preparation for them to get used to the crowds of people and experience the walk over to the racetrack to be saddled and run. So I rode this horse, one of my horses that I rode, her name was Princess Ardor. I will never forget Princess Ardor. She was about as dingy as they come. Every time I would take her to the racetrack, I wasn't sure if I was going to come back with her, that she would dump me and, and run off. But so I saw on the overnight that that afternoon I was going to take Princess Ardor to the, the racetrack, put her in a waiting stall while the other horses were being saddled, and then you'd bring her home. So I'm over there with her, and she is having a fit. She will not go in this stall that she's supposed to go in. My trainer's up in the stand. He sees I'm having trouble. He comes down to help me. He takes her by the, 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 uh, the shank, and I go around to the back of her, and I'm waving my hands and kissing at her, trying to get her to go forward. Well, there's this hedge at Hollywood Park, and I knew it was there, and I was watching it so I didn't walk into it, and I'm trying to get her to move forward, and I looked behind me for a moment, and when I came back, she had taken two steps back, and she kicked me both feet in my stomach. So I... I collapse on the, on, the stand, on, the, on the ground. There's 20,000 people in the grandstands. They all gasp. The ambulance comes, takes me off to the hospital, finds out I have three broken ribs. They wrap me up, and they send me home. Um, my trainer, Bob, had come to give me a ride home from the emergency room. And uh, I said, Bob, I said, my stomach really hurts bad. And he said, well, David, I played football in college, and I broke my rib once, and it just really hurts. And it's just kind of the way it is. So that night I went to sleep in my tack room, sleeping quarters in the barn. I wake up in the middle of the night. I go to the bathroom, and the urine is all blood. I'm bleeding internally. I kind of pass out in my room. In the morning they find me. They race me back to the hospital. And one of my kidneys was punctured by the broken rib. So I, I sit in the hospital for 21 days because the surgeon, Dr. Sapiro, said that as young as I was, usually when they operate, they end up taking out the kidney, and he didn't want that to happen. So he said, I'm going to wait, and hopefully the kidney will heal itself as it's not bleeding really, really bad, and maybe it'll heal itself. Well, it didn't. They operated. make a long story short, they were able to save the kidney. They sewed it up. 
A few weeks later, I was out of the hospital. Two months later, I was back at the racetrack riding again. My parents were having a fit. <laughs> it was two years into the program, and I had two and a half more years to go. Fast forward, four and a half years go by. My trainer, Bob Kraft at Hollywood Park, says, David, it's time for you to start racing. We're going to send you back to our trainer in Ohio, John Burke. He has a nice stable of horses. It's going to be a learning process to start racing professionally. We don't want you to start racing at Santa Anita. If you make a mistake here, it's tough to start over again. We're going to have you make your mistakes at the smaller racetrack, and hopefully then you can progress to a more larger racetrack. Now, if you can imagine, I have been dreaming about racing for four and a half years. I mean, I'm, this is like the most exciting thing you can imagine for me to dream about racing. So, so um, um, Mr. Burke, I forgot his first name already, uh, he, put, he puts me on a horse, and the horse is Watch Dusty. Watch Dusty is a first-time starter. He's never ridden in a race before. I'm a first-time starter. Now, in order to get your license, you have to go before the stewards. There's three stewards at every racetrack. They are like the governing body of the racetrack. Uh, they make the rules. They give you the licenses. They make all the judgments. So I go to interview in front of them, and, and they knew that I had come through the Ellsworth program, and they knew that we had a good experience. So they said, this is the deal. We want you to ride two races without your whip. We, we don't want you to get into any trouble. We just want to watch you get around the track twice. If you don't fall off your horse or cause any problems, we'll give you your license after two races. And I said, great, I can do that. So the whip is something from the day you start to ride, you have a whip in your hand. It feels very, you feel naked without this whip, but that's what they wanted, so that's what I was going to do. Now, I've been galloping horses at Thistle Downs for about a month. And I knew that the inside of the racetrack, when the track got muddy, got slow. All the jockeys knew that. And of course, the day I'm riding my first race, it's pouring rain. I draw the one position. So there's, I'm here, and there's 11 horses to the outside of me. The gates open. The horse next to me comes over, practically not poor Watch Dusty to the ground. He stumbles. By the time we get going again, they're all gone. I'm about from here to that corner of the room behind. And I have some choices to make. They're all in a bunch to the outside because they don't want to be in the heavy mud. I don't want to pull in behind them because I don't want to eat mud for three quarters of a mile. I can't go way out behind them because that'll look kind of silly me way out there. So I have this big opening in the middle that's heavy mud. And I said, well, I'll just go up in there and see what happens. So I gallop up in there, and before I know it, Watch Dusty has caught up to the pack, and we're galloping along in the mud, and they're all right there beside me. So the race is three quarters of a mile. We make it around. At the half mile, I'm still even with them. And by the time we get to the head of the stretch, he's actually in front. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so bad. I have, you know, used him up completely. And he's just going to stop, and they're all going to go running by me. So we're going down the stretch. We get to the eighth pole, and I'm still in front. We get to the 16th pole, and I'm still in front. And then here comes one horse, and he is gaining on me every stride. And the wire is just right there. So I reach with my hand, and I slap him on the shoulder. And he drops it in another gear. He takes off, and we win the race. It was the most incredible experience. So that's what this article is about. They, they, they came and interviewed me because it, it's, it's rather rare that you would win your first professional race, especially without a whip. So they, they wrote some nice articles about it. So I'm going to tell you some of the highlights of this 10-year journey. I, I, we can't go over 10 years of racing in an hour, but I'm going to tell you some highlights. So, so the Ellsworth, they got me started racing. Of the first 20 horses they gave me to ride, I won five of the races. So these people were really good to me. They didn't just put me on some old nags to fulfill their obligation. They gave me some live horses to ride. So 
And I think Charming Link was the second, this race here, that was the second horse I rode, and she won. And then I won the next five, five out of 20. And then they want, they need to get rid of you to take more boys coming up through the system. So they get you an agent. Uh, they sell you, you have a contract. You are literally an indentured servant to these people. You're under contract to them. And you can be sold just like an indentured servant. So, but it's a good thing. They want to sell you to someone who wants you so you can be his jockey for his people and then hopefully you move up, move up in the ranks. So I was sold to a man by the name of Doc Pesson. Now Doc Pesson was a wealthy man in Kentucky and he had a beautiful training center that they would um, train horses and he was uh, a character right out of the movie. I mean, just the name, Doc Pesson. And he was a veterinarian and he would run horses at Louisville, but his training center was in Lexington and he would ship his horses from Lexington to Louisville every day and race horses. And when I first came to work for him, I was under the impression that I was going to be his jockey rider. But he started using me just as an exercise boy. And the other two exercise boys would say to me, David, aren't you a jockey? Didn't you just win some races? And I said, yes. Well, they said, why isn't Doc Pesson riding you? And I said, I don't know. And it's not my position to tell him what to do. Uh, he's my boss. And Doc Pesson every day would come back from the races and he would be cussing and throwing these tickets in the air. And he said, all these blankety jockeys, they can't ride a stick horse. If I could just find a good jockey to ride my horses, maybe I would win a race. So after about a month of this going on, he comes to me and he says, David, he says, none of these jockeys can ride. I'm going to give you, uh, you know, I can't do any worse to ride you, so I'm going to give you a shot. So he names me on this horse, actually, that horse. And he, uh, he says, uh, I'm going to have you ride all my horses and let's see what happens. So the morning of the race, I noticed the groom putting the horse in the, in the, the trailer and he, he has a big bale of hay. And I say to the groom, I said, why, what are you doing with the hay? He's going to race today. You can't feed him the morning of the race. He's, well, Doc Pesson, we feed all our horses in the morning. And I said, you can't do that. You've got to take that away. And he says, I can't. Doc Pesson will fire me if I don't do what he says. And I said, if Doc Pesson could win a race, he'd be so happy. Trust me. Take away the feed. Two hours before the race, take away the water. And maybe we'll have a chance to win. I'm sorry, that's not the horse. So this particular race, the horse runs second. And Doc Pesson comes back and he says, Oh, I knew this kid could ride. I knew this kid could ride, talking about me. Of course it wasn't me. It was just the fact that the horse wasn't running with a full stomach. So all the horses that Doc Pesson started racing now, we didn't, he didn't know, but we weren't feeding them before the race, and they ran so much better. And so he had a history of, of never winning a race. So it took the betting audience weeks to figure out that now his horses were running better and in the interim Doc Pesson was betting on all of them and he was making lots of money gambling and so he was happy. So one day I'm riding one of his horses, this horse. We're, we race around the track. Uh, she's running second. I'm about 10 lengths behind the winner. I'm not going to catch him. And all of a sudden she decides she's going to jump over the rail. So she tries to leap over the rail. She hits the rail, falls down. I was quite a ways ahead of the pack, and I had just enough time to crawl under the rail before they to me. They had to jump over her because she was still down. This jockey here, you can see in the movie, he actually had to steeplechase over her. So now I'm back to the ambulance again, off to the hospital I go, and I'm in the hospital. Luckily, I didn't break any bones or hurt myself. I'm just kind of like beat up. And about three days later, here comes Doc Pesson with this man I do not know. His name was Ronnie Warren. And he says, David, he says, guess what? The horse is fine. She's not even hurt. And I got her entered back in in three days. You got to get out of here so you can ride her again. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they want me to ride this crazy horse again? But this man that was with Doc, 
I knew something was up. He didn't say anything, and I sensed that it was important that I ride this horse again. So I ride the horse again. She actually runs second. And then this other gentleman approaches me and he says, David, I'm Ronnie Warren. I want to buy you away from Doc Peston. I want to take you to, to uh, Florida. I have a stable of horses. I'm, you're going to ride all my horses at Hylia, Calder, and Gulfstream. And I think, wow, this is great. Now, in the interim between this Doc Peston incident, I actually went to Detroit for the Ellsworth people. And I was in Detroit racing, and a jockey approached me in the jockey's quarters, and he says, David, I understand you're going to ride the particular horse next week. And we've been watching him, and he looks like he, he's capable of winning. We would like to give you the win money in cash right now if you would let me ride your horse. The other jockey is talking to me. And I'm thinking, no, I don't think I want to do that because I know what they're up to. They're going to fix a race, and they don't want my horse to interfere with the fixing they're doing. And so I say, no, thank you. So I go to the barn the next morning, and the trainer says, David, we have problems. A couple of men in black suits visited me last night, and they said it would not be smart to run our horse next week. But they said they were really nice guys. They told me the winner is going to be Sammy A., so if you, you can bet on Sammy A and make some money, and next week you can run and you'll win. So I actually got transferred to another track uh, before that horse, before our turn to win happened, but we, I was there to watch Sammy A win. And it was an obvious fix because in the beginning, Sammy A was off a little slow and you could see all the other jockeys holding back on their horses until Sammy A got to the front and then you could see them kind of faking like they were trying to catch him to the wire and Sammy A wins. So the, the mafia is alive and well in Detroit at this particular time. So then, then I went to Doc Peston and this happened. Now I go to Florida with Ronnie Warren. Now, Ronnie Warren was a really uh, cowboy type guy. Let's see, this is, uh, this is Ronnie Warren down here. And, and he is a tough trainer. He's an old cowboy. And I think that he was living his desire to have been a jockey, because, but he was too big through me. And he became my mentor, my trainer. He taught me, we would go to the races every day, and he would, we would watch the, the best jockeys, Angel Cordero, uh, these riders who were the, the elite riders, and he would say, you know, watch these guys. Watch how they break out of the gate. Watch how they use their whip. This is how you do it. And he, he tutored me. And so one day, he had never won a race at Hialeah. And that was a big deal to win a race at Hialeah. And one day, we were running four horses. I was riding four horses for him. And we won the first two. And the horse that we thought was going to do well actually w hadn't run yet. And so we thought we were going to win like three races in a row. And Ronnie was beside himself in the saddling pack. He was so nervous. It was so funny to have the, see him be so excited to have won two races already and the prospect of winning the third. Well, actually, did, we didn't win the third. But in Florida, we had a lot of, of publicity because we were on a training center, and sometimes the times of our horses did not get transferred to the racing form in time, and the information given to the betters maybe wasn't accurate, and we were winning races that nobody knew about, and it was, we got some publicity as to why the, these sort of things were happening, but this was all part of the racing world. So, these types of things were happening all the time, and, and uh, there was just so much excitement. The, uh, when I, the, my difficulty was I was too big. I, I, right now I weigh 142 pounds, and when I was racing I had to weigh 105 pounds. I was too tall, which obviously because of, caused the weight, and I had, I had no experience prior to that, so I had to, to learn all of this. So after 
about four years of racing, of going to bed hungry and thirsty almost every night. I, I had accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I had had so many great experiences that I decided it was time to, to start eating again because I was concerned about my health. When I was in Ohio, jockeys told me about this diet pill called Escatrol, which I found out later was just an amphetamine in a time capsule. And all the jockeys took these amphetamines. And when I was in uh, Florida, I would see these jockeys running around the room, and I think they were on stuff much more potent than, than Escatrol. And I remember the first time I, the very first time I took an Escatrol, it was like a little contact with the little pills inside. And I didn't sleep for like a day and a half. I was like so wired. But yet I had the struggle of just being so hungry. So what I would do is I would break open one of these capsules, and when I was just dying of hunger, I would just take a few little, like a, an eighth of a pill, and that would appease the hunger. But what scared me was even in that little dose, if I didn't take another dose like three days later, I was just craving to have it again. So I, I realized the dangers of what drugs could do to you. So after all that experience, and, and having had a, a, a very exciting and, and fairly su successful career, I decided to hang it up. So I went back home. I was going to go back to school. I was uh, decided to get a job as an exercise rider at Hollywood Park. Now, Hollywood Park is a premier track in California, and I went to work for one of the trainers who I knew from before. And because I'm a retired jockey, I could make really good money for working just a couple hours in the morning. And we had this horse named Victorian Prince. And he was one of the horses that Mike Whittingham asked me to ride every day. He was five years old. And I was, it was just great to ride him because I didn't, I, I gained weight and I weighed probably in this picture, I probably weighed 130. And I didn't have to diet and I was making good money and I could just really enjoy the, the riding the horses at the racetrack. And he started to blossom. And he said, and uh, Mike said, David, we're gonna, I want, there's a good race in Arlington a park, the Isaac Murphy Memorial Handicap. I went, we're going to put him on a plane and send him to, to this race. So here I am with Victorian Prince heading off to Arlington Park. And it was just, I was going to be the assistant trainer, the exercise boy, the groom. I was every, everybody, I was everything to this horse. So I off the plane I go, we go to Arlington Park and uh, there's two big races. The first one is Isaac Murphy, and then two weeks later is the Arlington Handicap. So he, he wins the Isaac Murphy. Two weeks later, he wins the uh, Arlington Handicap. This is, this, these are $100,000 races, but in this time, this was pretty exciting stuff. And then we shipped him up to uh, Canada, and he won the Bundy Lawless. So he had won three major races in a row. And there's a race called the United Nations handicap. And we got invited to that because of the, the races he had just won this summer. And the morning of the race, I go into his stall and his ankle is swollen. And he had kicked the stall or something. And we had to scratch him. But I, I know that he was on a roll that summer. And he probably would have done really well for the, for the international race. But we had won three big races in a row. It was, it was the most exciting time. I was living there with him, training him, exercising him, working out. And this was, the track photographer came out because he, he was in the news a lot. And he took this picture of me. This was the, the day before he won the Arlington Handicap. And if you look here, you can see the, the the, my arm, how I'm just holding this horse back. I only wanted to let him stretch out three-eighths of a mile. I didn't want him to run his race the day before. So I just have a hold of him. And the, the feeling of, of riding these horses like this, just amazing, just amazing. So the, I think there's a moral to this story. And the moral is, the day that I won this first race, I do not believe for a moment that I did anything special. 
but I do believe the universe can smile down on someone for the four and a half years that I worked hard. And, and I, I talk to a lot of young people and I tell them, I said, I think the saddest thing would be to have a dream, not pursue it, and to always wonder what might have been. It would be better to go and have it not work out the way you want, but at least you know. And so I, I feel so fortunate to have had this crazy dream when I was 20 and have it work out pretty well. I got out without the kidney thing was the most serious I got hurt. To have this experience and not be permanently injured, as you know, many jockeys are killed over uh, every year. I think one or two jockeys die every year. Ron Turcott, who won the Triple Crown and Secretariat, he was permanently paralyzed. So it's a dangerous profession. And I was very fortunate to never be seriously hurt and, and have a, a really exciting career. So I, I, I thank you for listening to that. And I thought I'd just throw it open to see if you folks have any questions about anything. Yes. Of course. So the first question was, once again. What, what do you think of, of oh, the, oh, the mindset, the mindset, the mindset of a thoroughbred. How, how a what is the, what yes, what is the mindset of a racehorse? You know, okay, that's a very good question. They vary tremendously. The horses have huge personality ranges. I mean, Victorian Prince, he was like a pet. Normally, when you get up on a horse, you have a groom holding him, and he legs you up. I could actually, I mean, he's just won these $100,000 hours in handicap, and I could grab his, his, uh, with his mane and swing up on him, and he wouldn't run off. You do that to a normal horse, he'd be halfway, but when your leg was up, he'd be down the shed row at full speed. And you just don't do that to a thoroughbred. And I remember when I was in the stable before these big races and I was the only person taking care of this horse and I would get out uh, to get up on him to take him out to the track and the other groom would say well let me leg you, leg you up and I said no I don't have to and I would swing up and they were just like what the heck. So he was an exception rather he than the norm. So talk about the norm. Okay the norm is they're very high spirited. They are jittery. They Everything frightens them. If there's a gum wrapper on the track and it wasn't there yesterday, they will steeplechase over it. If there is a sound that they haven't heard before, if somebody makes any little sound, they will jump sideways. They are very temperamental. They, they're wild. And they love to run. I know there's a lot of people think it's cruel to race horses, but they love to run. And I honestly believe that they know when they've done well. I don't know if they know if they want to race, but they like to run and they enjoy running. And and the whip is not cruel. It could be, but generally it's not. It's just it's just a way to to keep them on, pay, paying attention because they their mind will wander sometimes down the track and you slap them on the shoulder just to keep their mind on, on the running. And then the second question was once again uh, what percent oh our our Okay, so, so you have mares, fillies, you have gildings, and you have the colts. So, so the, the gildings happens when a horse is unmanageable, when they are just too filled with testosterone to keep them uh, on their mind of racing, then they gild them. But they don't gild them if they have the potential for breeding. So it's, it's a tough decision sometimes what to do with a overly a studly horse because you don't if it has the potential for breeding then you don't want to take that away but if if the if the uh, 
testosterone is keeping them from being able to run well, then uh, that makes it difficult too. So, so generally, I would say it's it's pretty pretty even across the board. It is. So yes. A, uh, even of, uh, male female. Absolutely. Yes. yes. There there was a horse. But the higher end show world. I, I've, I've shown in different disciplines. The higher end show world, the Grand Prix level, with the warm bloods and some thoroughbreds, most of them are all gelding. Oh no no definitely not the case. I would say. Yes, and, and they will have races the, the, uh, when they put out the races, they will have races for, you know, two-year-old colts or, or two-year-old gildings or, or fillies, you know, whatever age, and, and then you, yes, so there's the full range. So the second half to that last question, has there ever been a mare to win a triple crown? No, but there was... But there was a filly, oh, golly, I, I shouldn't know her name. You've got to watch this on YouTube. Uh, her name was, oh, I can't think of it. But if you just put in, just put in, um, and go to YouTube and put in famous thoroughbred mare, undefeated, 15 races. She was undefeated in 15 races. And she would run, she ran against the boys like the last half of that. And she beat them all. And the only reason she lost her last race, which was, I believe, the 16th, and it was because the jockey uh, miscalculated when to let her run. But she would have gone down undefeated. And she won against the Colts. But no, no filly has ever won the Kentucky Derby or the Triple Crown. But uh, there's been a few really good fillies who have uh, beat the boys, yes. Anything else? Pardon me, David, I'm sorry, I was moving on. What is the Ellsworth program? Okay, so the Ellsworth, as I mentioned, they won the Kentucky Derby with swaps, and they had a horse named Candy Spots, and they literally created a jockey school so you would go to the jockey school, enter into an agreement to ride, be their exercise rider for four to five years, and then when they felt you were proficient enough, then you would become a jockey and they would give you your first horses to ride, which was a huge deal. Many of the boys that I started with were lured away after two or three years from, uh, with, from, with uh, other trainers would lure them away from the program, promising them more money each week and they said oh why are you working for fifty dollars a week for these guys you know why don't you come over here i'll pay you you know five hundred dollars a week or a month and and then i'll get you started racing but the reality was it was talk because a trainer is working for the owners and the trainer decides what jockey is going to ride the horse but he has to answer to to the owner so you've been training a horse for one or two or three months and now you're going to race this horse and especially at the big time tracks like Santa Anita or Hollywood Park or any of those you it's hard to tell a, a tra a, an owner you're going to put a jockey with no experience on, on this horse. They say, no, I want Angel Cordero, I want Lafitte Pinkai. You don't be playing around with some new kid on my horse. So. It's tough to, when you're starting to get some live horses. And, and so, like I was saying, the Ellsworth, after four and a half years, they put me on good live horses and then, and then got me an agent and got me going. So they did, they did everything they said they would do, which was really admirable because so many other boys, I, w I would say that there were probably 50 boys who were around me in that time time frame and I think only maybe seven of us actually became jockeys. It, it's a very tough profession. It's like, it's like going to Hollywood and say I'm going to become an actor. And then even among the successful ones you have probably 20 who are like the Brad Pitts and the ones who are making the serious money and then you have a few average ones, and then you have a whole bunch who are just struggling to make a living. Yeah. What were your favorite 
reduce tracks. Oh, wow, I love Santa Anita. That's why I learned to ride at Santa Anita. Santa Anita is so beautiful. You've got the mountains in the background, and, and the, the, all the racetracks are just so, um, you know, they, they, in the, that era, they're racing, this was before off-track betting, and so the people came to the racetracks, and, and they wanted the racetracks to be just like the old days. There was a lot of glamour. You had to be wearing a suit and tie to get into the clubhouse. You had very wealthy. I remember one time I, I sat in uh, the uh, a box seat with uh, Doc Severinsen. He was there. And you had all these famous people uh, milling around with their horses. And, and to be in that, you know, circle and watching it and 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 Bill let me tell you a little thing about Bill Shoemaker so when you are an exercise boy you are in some people's view some of the other jockeys who are very successful they kind of look at you as a bit lower than them and so when you're on the racetrack if you would get in their way it's like oh these exercise boys you know they're always in our way they don't know what's going on and so when you're learning to ride you do make a lot of mistakes and you're out there trying to control your horses and try and be where you're supposed to be and pe get out of people's way and you make mistakes and I remember uh, of course that we knew who, who Billy Shoe, Bill Shoemaker was the most famous jockey that ever lived and ever no one had ever won more races than him and one day the three of us Ellsworth boys were walking to the racetrack, and there's a, there's a path through the through the uh, saddling area, through the tunnel, out onto the track, and here comes Shoemaker, Shoemaker, on, on and when he goes on the track to get on a horse, you better believe it's some famous horse that is going to run in some big race. So he's walking towards us, and we're looking at each other. That's Bill Shoemaker coming this way, and and as he passed us. He looked over to us and he said, good morning, riders. And to say rider, that is a real compliment. That's a really kind thing to say to anybody. So here we were getting teased by other jockeys, you know, that we weren't maybe so, so good. And to have Shoemaker was very classy of him to say that to us. Yeah, good guy. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. The, uh, Chris has been so kind to record this, so maybe they'll put it and some other people can, uh, can hear the story. But thank you so much.